Good afternoon. I am Karina Wilhelm, archivist for the ASC Center for Archaeology and Society Repository and AZLA Professional Development Committee member. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Um, the a AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase their knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat um, at the bottom of your screen. To ask questions anonymously, uh, you can submit them directly to the hosts and panelists using that option instead of to everyone. You can turn on live transcript and, and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Cheryl Gerken will be your technical director today. You can contact her via the chat if you have any technical issues during the webinar. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, dial in using the phone number provided in your registration and confirmation email. And can everybody hear me okay? I think we're having some problems, but okay. All right. Um, I will continue on then. At the end of the webinar, we ask the uh, complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use this data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd like to encourage uh, library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Please visit www.azla.org for additional information. The Professional Development Committee is seeking proposals for upcoming webinars. If you have expertise in library science that you think would be helpful to other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in the webinar follow-up email. The Professional Development Committee invites you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On September 14th, join us for Centering Community, Building Connections and Resilience Through Climate Programming with Kenny Anderson and Jenna Ortega. Rising temperatures, intense drought, and increased wildfire and flooding risks are on the horizon for communities across the state. Amid these prospects, the Flagstaff City, Coconino County Public Library and Flagstaff Sustainability Office teamed up to create the Climate Resilience Project, which provides programs aimed at bringing an intergenerational community group together to talk, learn, and take action on local climate and resilience issues. In this webinar, you will find out what we have learned through our cross-departmental collaboration and how to implement locally relevant and personally meaningful climate and resilience programming that addresses community concerns through, uh, through a community of practice framework. Registration for this webinar is posted at the AZLA calendar, Arizona State, Arizona State Library calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. Thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Aaron McFarlane and Kent Oliver for their pres presentation, Advocacy in the US of AZ, How Arizona Fits into the National Advocacy Ecosystem. Due to the sensitive nature of this session, the Q&A segment will not be recorded. I'll turn the time over. Um, Aaron, I believe you're still muted. Hello, everyone. So, there we go. That's better. You think by now I'd figure it out. All right. Um, <laughs> good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 
I am excited to be here. If you don't know me, many of you do. I'm Erin McFarlane. I am the legislative chair for the Arizona Library Association. Um, I, my job, I work for Maricopa County Library District um, and the de deputy director in our administrative offices. Um, and I also do some policy work with the American Library Association through their Policy Corps program, um, which is how I am able to bring Kent here with us today, which I'm excited to introduce um, Kent Oliver. You can talk a little bit about the work that you've done um, with advocacy and uh, censorship issues over the years. I'm grateful I get to work with and learn from Kent through this process. So I'll let him go ahead and introduce himself. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. And uh, briefly, my history is I've been active uh, throughout my career involving intellectual freedom and advocacy at both the state and national level. Um, member of ALA Council and Executive uh, Board, in addition to chairing Intellectual Freedom Committee and the Freedom to Read Foundation, and a long time member of committees related to the Public Policy and Advocacy Office. And uh, career-wise, I was recently a director of the Nashville Public Library and had been director of uh, public libraries previous to that. But I'm pleased to be here today as, I, I hate the word senior fellow, but my official title is senior fellow for the Public Policy and Advocacy Office uh, with uh, the American Library Association. And specifically, I work with the policy core in that office You'll hear a little bit about what that is later on, and a group of uh, really dedicated ALA members working in the policy core that are supporting Unite Against Book Bans. All right, thank you. So um, we're going to go over this quick agenda. This is what we're planning on talking about this afternoon. Um, we'll do introductions, which we just did. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our current national political climate and the way that book bans and censorship have fit into that climate. Um, this isn't anything new. I know many of you are dealing with this at your libraries. So, but we just kind of briefly want to go over what it looks like and what's been happening across the country. I'll talk a little bit about our 2023 Arizona legislative session, which just ended on July 31st. It was the longest session in the history of Arizona. So I'll talk a little bit about what bills we saw come up in the legislature and how those went through and what ended up happening. Um, and then Ken and I are gonna kind of discuss how Arizona fits into that national landscape. We'll talk a little bit about Policy Corps and uh, Unite Against Book Bans, which is um, the group that is getting together to push back and fight against some of what's happening across the country. Um, like we talked about earlier in the um, session, we will have a question and answer session at the end after we talk, um, and we are not going to record that because this can some of the issues here can be sensitive. We want to respect everyone's ability to speak frankly about what might be happening in your libraries and ask the questions um, that you have. Uh, we might not know any uh, everything, but like the librarians, we should be able to help point you to some resources. So that's one of the last things on that list there. All right, so let's dig in so we have time for everything. Okay. Um, well, just to give you a thumbnail of what I, I hope most of you are aware of, but uh, currently the United States is experiencing what I would only call a deeply antagonistic culture war. And uh, it's been generated by our political partisanship and societal differences. And, uh, you know, librarians are caught right in the middle of this. Um, you know, it's about driving political wedges and really power transactions within our political system. And um, unfortunately, as librarians, we do find that what's happening is threatening uh, our core values, um, our constitutional rights and constitutional guarantees and it's even bleeding over into the relationship we have with our governing bodies to the point of where our budgets are very much going to be impacted by the discussions we're seeing in the intellectual freedom area. Um, and, and just kind of a, a general history, I think we're all familiar with the, the term Moms for Liberty or the group Moms for Liberty. And if you want to deep a little bit into the background of that group, you'll find that really their work began uh, as uh, an effort uh, as an anti-abortion group. 
and uh, the politics that we're seeing, uh, that group uh, play onto libraries is very much founded in that anti-abortion work. Um, to give you some specific uh, ideas about how this is really impacting us practically in the library world, uh, as an example, if you've been following uh, the library news this week, uh, Follett, uh, the book distributor to, to schools, has been uh, looking at how how Spill 900 in Texas is impacting the way they distribute books and is encouraging uh, publishers to actually begin labeling books. And uh, we all know how we feel about book labeling and uh, just another form of censorship. And uh, but that is one practical way that we are, are seeing that this fight is, is impacting librarians, obviously on a personal level um, and professional level. So the slide you see up before you uh, really illustrates the fact that we're a nation divided um, over important issues in K through 12 education, including which books students should be able to read in public school. And you know this was really pulled over into the public and academic side. And opposition to materials on subjects can range from anti-police, uh, LGBTQIA+, sexual conduct, emphasis on social justice, uses racial slurs, anti-Semitism, and promoting religious viewpoints. And, you know, as a librarian who's been around a while, I think the thing most of us have always felt like is that, yeah, we're going to get book challenges around one or two books that parents maybe don't understand uh, why are in the library, and the librarian will have a one-on-one -on -one a discussion with those parents or one on two discussion with those parents and they'll understand that the value of having a diversified collection that represents all viewpoints in the community but now what we're seeing are challenges no longer focus on these one or two books but uh, people are coming in requesting 50 to 100 books at a time uh, be removed and this is obviously an organized effort with a deliberate playbook that's happening all around the country. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the book challenges are extending not just to the collection, but they are becoming both verbal and threatening attacks on librarians throughout the country. You might take a second, and just look at this slide. It's really everything libraries stand for Maybe not the nudity, but uh, anyway, just uh, it, it gives you a sense of the of the of the breadth and the depth of what is being attacked in our in our libraries. All right, that's right. You're fine. Let's go. Let's go on to this next slide. All right. Um, so book censor, book sex and censorship are a long tradition in the United States. And uh, in the 1800s, really censorship was widely supported. And that was an offshoot, I believe, of the Civil War and, and what we saw in a, in a wartime America. And a prominent example of this is the episode of the Comstock Act in 1873. And, and the, the Comstock Act made it illegal to send obscene, lewd, or lascivious, immoral, were in decent publications through the mail, and it became actually a misdemeanor to sell, give away, or possess an obscene book, pamphlet, picture, drawing, or advertisement. And the reason it's called the Comstock Act is that after Congress passed the, uh, the act that uh, Anthony Comstock was given uh, the uh, the job of, of actually enforcing this act. He was in charge of the group suppressing vice in New York City. And he became a special agent for the United States Post Office. So if you're interested in digging into a, a lot of different cases involving intellectual freedom, some of those that you might think about are United States, the one book named Ulysses, Roth versus the United States, Butler versus the state of Michigan, Memoirs versus Massachusetts, and the one many of us are familiar with, Miller versus California. 
And the real reason for this slide is that, you know, it kind of illustrates the fact that censorship is not new in our country. It's not a new phenomenon. Book challenges and censorship have always been with us. The issue is that right now they're at a whole all time high and it's happening in our country, even though any national poll will tell you the majority of Americans really are not in favor of, of censorship. Now, we, we went by a slide earlier uh, that gave you the number uh, that ALA comes up with. Well, thanks, Aaron. Um, that as far as reported book challenges last year in 2022. And the number you see in front of you is probably a certain percentage of all book challenges that actually happened. Uh, many people or libraries do not report book challenges or, or censorship uh, to ALA's Office of Intellectual Freedom. And the part we do not have up here, the graph, there's another graph on the Office of it for Intellectual Freedom website that has a number over 2,000. And that is the number of individual titles that have been challenged. And I suspect that number is much higher as well. But when somebody is coming in and challenging 50 to 100 books at a pop, and they're on a national list being circulated, you can see why that number is so high. All right, I think that's a great overview of uh, where we are nationally. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about where Arizona falls into that. Um, one of the things that we're seeing with this organized, structured move towards censoring materials, which Kent talked about, this is not you know, a mom that has read a book and decided that she doesn't want her child to read it. This isn't what we have typically seen through the years with challenges. This is people learning through social media or organizations, a list of books that that organization feels is not appropriate and then bringing them to the library. So. What we've seen with that is that bills that are written and proposed in states other than Arizona are then copycatted and kind of move across the country. So a lot of the bills that we're seeing in state legislators be, the legislatures began in Florida. Um, Florida wrote bills. Some of them got through. Some of them didn't. They might have gotten picked up by Texas, picked up by Arkansas. It's copycat legislation. So a couple of the bills that I'll talk about today in Arizona are very similar to bills that were introduced in Virginia, bills that were introduced in Arkansas and Oklahoma and Florida over the last year. Um, and some of them have been tweaked. We have a colleague that works in Virginia, um, and they had a lawsuit against a bill, um, or it was a proposed bill um, about titles that were obscene. And that word obscene has very specific law that has been in place for years over what is the definition of obscene and what they were finding was what their definition did not match the law. So they changed that wording, same exact bill, but they changed it to sexually explicit. So what we're seeing is as those changes happen and they spread across the country, people are using that term sexually explicit instead of obscene and they're getting passed through. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the 56th Arizona Legislative Session. Our Arizona Legislative Sessions open annually the second Monday in January. So this year that our um, legislature convened on January 9th. The first couple of weeks are the bill introduction time. So during that time, our legislature introduced 1,675 bills. Um, through the session, if you are curious about how the legislature works, we did a session last December. Um, the December AZLA webinar has a whole session on how the legislature works and how bills are passed into law. So I encourage you to go back and watch that. This year, 348 bills were passed. So it went between both houses. They were passed to the governor. The governor vetoed a record 143 of those bills. Prior to this, I think the record was like in the 40s, maybe I have to go back and, do my, and look. Um, but it was a lot higher this year that Governor Hobbs vetoed, which is indicative of that split government. So our legislature is Republican. The governor is a Democrat. A lot of the bills that got passed through were vetoed. 205 became law. And as I said earlier, um, our legislature just adjourned July 31st. It was the longest legislative session in Arizona history. Um, and they had adjourned for chunks of time during that period. The last little bit, um, they were working through a proposal and a compromise on Prop 400, which is a transportation bill in Maricopa County. So let's talk about what AZLA tracked. Um, I'm also gonna give you a slight background on how the legislative committee for AZLA works. 
As you all know, AZLA is a volunteer organization. All of us that do work for AZLA are volunteers. Nobody gets paid. Um, and our legislative committee is small. Um, so I take the lead on a lot of the work for the advocacy alerts, things like that. I have a committee that helps with website stuff, providing feedback. Um, but I want you, I think it's important that everyone understand that there is a limitation on what the legislative committee can do as we move into responding to this legislation. We also employ a lobbyist. So AZLA, part of the funding that we get and the money that you pay into AZLA is to support a lobbyist that can help us track bills at the legislature um, and do work for us that we can't do because we are not lobbyists with AZLA and we are limited to the amount of time that we can spend at the legislature with our um, nonprofit status. So this year we tracked 15 bills that would impact library services. And that's a wide variety of different kinds of bills. A couple were um, actually would have been positive. So some of them are kind of neutral. And so a lot of them would have had negative impacts. But an example of one that would have been positive was proposed by May Peshlaki, um, Peshlaki, I'm not gonna say that correctly. Um, and that would have been that every public school, public university, community college, state or local park and library or other local government building would have a native um, American land acknowledgement put up in there. That bill did not get far, but that was one that we tracked because it would have affected libraries and that we would have had to put a land acknowledgement in the library. So just to give you an example of the broad sweep, um, many of them are related to schools, which would have had an impact on school libraries. Um, one of them was to change the date that a library trustee would have to turn in their annual report. So that's pretty uh, pretty bland there. They wanted to change it from the first week of July to the second because often it would fall on the 4th of July, which is a federal holiday. So, you know, some of the legislation that goes through is kind of tedious and, you know, includes libraries, but isn't that impactful. Um, there were two bills that were very, would have been very impactful and very negative to library services in Arizona. Both of them, again, were very similar to bills that were proposed and passed in other conservative states through the country. Um, so one of them was Senate Bill 1696, which was proposed by um, Republican Jake Hoffman, who was from the Queen Creek area. Um, and so this doesn't specifically say libraries, but I'm going to kind of read it out so you can get an idea of the, what would have been the impact. The state, a state agency, or a county, municipality, or political subdivision of Arizona is prohibited from exposing minors to, quote, sexually explicit materials, which they defined, and must prohibit its contractors from exposing minors to sexually explicit materials. A facility or property owned or leased or managed by these entities is prohibited from being used for filming or facilitating sexually explicit acts. Violation are a class five felony. So basically, had that bill passed and had it been taken as the word of law and to the letter, had a librarian handed someone to kill a mockingbird in a public library and that person taken it to the law enforcement, a librarian could have had a class five felony for providing sexually explicit material because as the law defines sexually explicit, to kill a mockingbird would have fallen under that. So um, the other law that would have been specific to libraries, get my paper in the right way, was SB 1700, which was proposed by Senator Justine Wadsack, who is uh, in Pima County, I think to the Northeast. Um, and so that would have been against, uh, this bill was specific to school libraries, and it talked about um, a parent who objects to a book that is available in the school library or that will be used for classroom instruction may request that the public educational institution remove the book from the library or classroom. So any parent could just have the book removed from the classroom. A parent who objects to a book because they find the book to be lewd or sexual in nature, to promote gender fluidity or gender pronouns, or to groom children into normalizing pedophilia, is required to submit the book and the basis for the finding to the Arizona Department of Education. The Department of Education would then be required to establish rules and procedures for maintaining a list of books that public educational institutions in Arizona are prohibited from using. So basically, ADE would have had to keep a list of banned books um, at the institution. 
So these were the two that we identified as being very negative to libraries. And so we started to work against them. So when I say we, it's the legislative committee as well as our lobbyist. So we worked with the lobbyist to come up with, you know, how these would be negative um, to students against the First Amendment, against the 14th Amendment. We talked through um, some of this with the Office of Intellectual Freedom at ALA on, you know, what could we do in opposition to these bills? Um, and so in the interest of time, what finally ended up happening was 1700 was stopped in committee, which means it was passed through the Senate. And then our lobbyist worked with the head of the education committee in the House. When that bill moved to the House, we had talked enough with the head of the education committee on how negative that bill would be that they chose not to put it on their committee um, hearings for last spring. So that bill did not move forward, was not passed. A lot of that you may have seen and um, participated in an advocacy alert to contact your senator or representative and tell them why that bill was bad. We sent those out to anybody that was on our advocacy list. So that's why it's important for you to be involved and for that grassroots advocacy because they heard from a lot of us. They got a lot of emails that said, this is bad for teachers, this is bad for librarians, please do not move this bill forward. And we were able to stop that before it was held in committee in the House. So that was what happened with 1700, the one that was bad for school libraries. 1696 passed through both houses and was sent to the governor. So the Senate passed it over to the House. They thought, ah, that's fine. They sent it back to the Senate. It was heard again um, and it was passed and sent to the governor. Um, and we worked with the lobbyists to understand, you know, what our odds were for a veto of that law. She said the odds were good, but this uh, governor also um, always finds it beneficial to have veto letters to support the veto. So it's not just the governor's decision saying, I veto this because I think it's bad. She can point to subject matter, matter experts and say, I think it's bad because librarians are telling me that it's bad and teachers are telling me that it's bad. So AZLA wrote a veto letter in support of the veto and sent that over. And Governor Hobbs did veto 1696. So neither of those bills were passed. So um, anyway, and that's what it says in one of those bullet points that of the 15 bills tracked, only one was passed into law and that one was vetoed by the governor. So um, we aren't always able to have success with vetoes or stopping things in committee, which we've seen in the past. Last year, we had a bill passed through that school libraries are still dealing with the fallout from that bill um, and how that's being applied across the state. Um, okay, so... Again, I just want to go back over that this is passed across the country. In 2023, over 110 book ban bills were introduced around the country. The ones that were first proposed in Florida and Texas became templates for censorship-friendly mm -hmm. states. And that's from Penn America. That's not just me saying it. Hey, Erin, I might, I might make a couple of comments here, too. First of all, I think your association should be really pleased at what I'd call a pretty successful effort to stop some of this legislation. Um, but to give you an idea in Tennessee where I am, I'm in Nashville, uh, you know, bills similar to these were actually passed last year because we did not have a, uh, a bipartisan government. We have a, a very Republican government, uh, conservative government. And um, specifically the textbook um, and, and library book bills that have passed here are going to have a huge impact upon the libraries in our state as they will in other states that have passed those. Um, it's interesting, for instance, another copycat bill in Arkansas that was recently stopped in the courts was uh, a bill that would have made it a felony uh, for librarians and bookstore owners if they had been found, found to have sexually explicit material or their har whatever harmful material would be considered. And another thing that I wanted to tag on to, I made a presentation this week and last week for a group of group of state librarians. And, you know, we, we've touched on the fact that sometimes these bill pa bills pass and they have no legal basis. We know that they're going to be struck down in court. But what we are finding is the people that are passing this, as you mentioned, are, are getting a little bit... Uh, they're learning from their mistakes and they're learning the type of language that you, you should be using. Uh, I, I saw in chat, somebody had asked you to uh, read the uh, the wording around sexually explicit from one of your bills. But, you know, words matter, especially in this arena. And, you know, 
one of the things that the policy core does is we talk about words and you, rather than using the term appropriate uh, or sexually appropriate or appropriate, we we use terms like developmentally relevant uh, when we're talking about books and schools. Because again, the, the language we use and the way we communicate what's going on is really critical. Yeah. It absolutely is. Um, and so speaking of that, and we will get to some of this at the end as well, but I am, Ken was talking about how things have changed a little bit. People are, um, what we're seeing also is not only um, that we're seeing proposed challenges to materials in the library, but also to library programs. And so when we're looking at talking about, you know, how we describe library programs, we've kind of changed a little bit of language around that as well, because we used to always use the term age appropriate, right? We have library programs that are age appropriate for the group that they're made for. Well, not everybody agrees on what's age appropriate for whom. And so we now try to say what's relevant. What is relevant for a toddler? What is relevant for a teen? What is relevant for a tween? Um, and so then those families can make their own decisions on whether what we're providing to their families is age appropriate for their own children. Um, because, you know, that is looking at the language and being thoughtful about that really does help to, you know, mitigate some of the conversations that you might have to have. So I did pull up 1696 if someone did ask about, you know, as that's defined. For the purpose of this section, sexual conduct means the, the acts of masturbation, sexual intercourse, or physical contact with a person's clothed or unclothed genitals, pubic area, buttocks, or the female breast. Sexual excitement means the condition of human, male, or female genitals when it is in a state of sexual stimulation or arousal. Sexually explicit materials includes textual, visual, or audio materials or materials accessed via any other medium that depict any of the following. Sexual conduct, sexual excitement, ultimate sex acts, and ultimate sex acts mean sexual intercourse, and then it lists all the different ways that you can have sexual intercourse. So as that is defined, when you look at physical contact with a person's clothed or unclothed genitals, it's pretty broad, and it can be pulled in a whole bunch of different directions. And so, um, you know, if you think about what's in your YA section and what kids are reading and how parents might interpret things differently, there are different ways that could be pulled in. So because of the vague, broad nature of the definition, um, and it's similar in all the bills that are introduced or from what I've seen as the bills are introduced, um, sexually explicit is often defined exactly that way. So, so what, I, what I'm hearing you say is that they've written a bill that's sexually explicit. Yes, that's exactly, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. So anyway, uh, and it's all about interpretation, right? If anybody, have, I've told the story a thousand times, but my oldest daughter was terrified of aardvarks when she was a kid. So when we used to go to the library, I always had to preview our books because if there was an aardvark in the book, it wasn't coming home with us because we had this weird, like in the middle of the night, there's an aardvark under my bed. I did not hand that book to the public librarian and say, please take this book off the shelf so other children are not scared of aardvarks. I made that choice for my family. And that's what our expectations are for all the families. I'm preaching to the choir. That's what we do in libraries. And that is when, you know, we're talking about this with people, families should be able to choose what their own children are reading and what their family has access to at the library. So moving on, this is, oh, I did a segue and I didn't even know it. Individuals should be trusted to make their own decisions about what to read. So what is being done? What are we doing nationally and here in Arizona um, to a degree to help to prepare and talk about challenges and address the issues as they come up. So I talked a little bit about what the organization does to support um, the fight against censorship at the legislature. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about Unite Against Book Bans, which is a national initiative to empower readers everywhere to stand together in the fight against censorship. So Ken, were you there in the beginning when this first started to become a thing at ALA? I, I was standing a little bit to the side. I was aware of it. At the, the Policy Corps uh, itself, and I don't know if you want to talk about Policy Corps and then UABB, but the Policy Corps was uh, a vision that LA President Jim Neal had. And the idea there being that, uh, and that was about 2017 or 18, but it, the idea being that um, we needed a group of librarians that would really dig into advocacy, would be trained, 
to address national issues and uh, would have the skill set that they'd be able to do so. And you were a prime example of that, a good example of that. But just the idea that these people would be advancing ALA goals, library values, um, both at the, at the state and local level, but at the national level with policymakers. Yep. And so I was part of Policy Core 3. So the way that you get become a part of it is you have an interest in policy and advocacy. There's an application process. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're a cohort and you go through a whole bunch of training, which is fascinating and super helpful. Um, so that's how I became part of Policy Core. Um, and then, you know, as we were seeing the censorship stuff come across and we were looking at how that's affecting policy and legislation, um, Unite Against Book Bans was created right. and Policy Core kind of came up with an idea to create a cohort of folks who had right. interest in this. Um, to come together and talk about what we can do on the boots on the ground in our libraries in our states across the country to provide support um, with policy and, you know, in different ways to bring people to Unite Against Book Bans and help fight against censorship. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different elements of this that, that you and I are, are familiar with, but it's just we need to be strategic about the way we advocate for libraries. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about messaging, it's about influencing public opinion, it's about advocating with public officials, it's about making sure that not just members of the policy score have a certain skill set in advocating, but any library director in any size library, whether it's public or school or academic, uh, really has some kind of tool set that they can advocate for their library's position uh, with whoever the decision makers are in their lives. And, and it's also about creating, um, you know, really a culture in communities that, you know, there's a right to read and there's a First Amendment and constitutional right to read. And it's not just the popular ideas that are represented in a in a public library or an academic library or school library, but there's really a need to have a broad approach to learning and education. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, let's see. All right. So we'll talk a little bit. So part of what policy core of the book banning group has been doing is having um, conversations like these where we're talking about this, encouraging folks like you to sign up for Unite Against Book Bans. If you haven't signed up yet, Arizona Library Association is a member, um, and you can also be a personal member. So the website's been on all the slides, um, and it's right up there at the top, unitedagainstbookbans.org. Um, and Kent talked a little bit about a toolkit. There's a great toolkit on there. There's a media toolkit. There's a toolkit for um, how you can support your community at school board meetings, at library trustee board meetings, um, and what to say, what to do if you are interested in writing an op-ed. All of the advocacy tools that you might need in support of United Against Book Bans or against censorship are available on that website. So I encourage all of you, if you haven't signed up yet, to go ahead and do that. Um, I've become pretty obnoxious with that and asking people all over the place to sign up for it. So uh, it's, it's pretty interesting when you talk to people. So, okay. Um, and so, yes, Ken. I just might say, too, as we're talking about all this and United Against Book Bans, um, it's really an interesting piece of, of ALA work because it's really a collaboration. It's a collaboration uh, between the Public Policy and Advocacy Office, which many of you knew as the Washington Office or have known as the Washington Office, and the Office for Intellectual Freedom. And, you know, the content there is really driven uh, through the Office for Intellectual Freedom, and everything is vetted that goes on there. It's it's the kind of thing that if it's messaging, then we go out and poll and make sure that it's resonating with people. Uh, the toolkits that you see are best practices that we've seen either currently or over the years. So it, it's really authoritative type of information that's there. It's not just random things that people sitting in an office at ALA have come up with. Mm -hmm. I'll have to agree to that, yeah. 
Um, and a lot of it is very useful. The talking points are useful. I've used some of that stuff or AZLA has when we are putting together talking points for you to contact your legislature or um, when we are when we were looking at the letter for the governor to veto um, SB 1696. So all of that stuff is available to you to take a look at. Um, the other thing that's interesting about United Against Book Bans, and then I want to move on before so that we have enough time for questions. Um, but the other thing that I find interesting about United Against Book Bans is that they do have a way to market segment your zip code. So they found success in areas that are having um, a large amount of parents showing up at a school board meeting to complain about books or ask to have books removed, where they contact anybody that's in UABB within that geographic area and say, hey, we expect at the school board meeting to have a bunch of folks showing up to complain about books. Can you also please show up in like as in favor of keeping items on the shelf? Because I think what we're hearing is there's a small group of people with very loud voices and the group of people that we know are there, the library supporters, you know, are there, but they're not always showing up to raise their voices as well. So um, that is actually super helpful. And uh, we've seen that happen in places like Galveston, Texas. Um, and, and then another place, I can't ever remember, what's the, that starts with an L can, in Texas? Lano. Lano, Texas. Um, they work to take books off the shelf. A, a judge said they had to put the books back on the shelves. So they decided to uh, um, county decided the answer to that was to defund the library. And they had a whole bunch of folks show up at a um, meeting where they discussed that to ask them to not defund the library. And so they're working through that. And there's currently a lawsuit um, from community members there as well. And so there have also been some wins. Um, one of the, the collaboration that Kent, Kent was talking about is important. So that's um, in relation to this slide. So being prepared to take action. One of the things that I will encourage all of you to do is talk to your colleagues Talk to your allies, talk to the people in your community that are in support of libraries already, because although we can be loud about this and we can believe in this and we know that, you know, we are constitutionally um, have the right to read, it, we're not going to be able to do this alone. And so if you can talk to your, um, you know, the community college librarians, all of the librarians should be getting together. Also talk to your independent bookstores. Talk to your literacy organizations, talk to your Rotary Clubs, talk to anybody in your community that you feel like would be a library supporter and a literacy supporter, um, and make sure that everybody knows what's going on and how the library feels and, you know, all of those things. So the more friends you have out there, the better off you'll be. So you can do that with your library. You can talk to your campus and community. Um, if you are a social media maven, um, I have so much respect for you. I am 100% <laughs> not. I am terrible at social media. So anytime that I have someone that would be willing to put information out, that's fabulous. Um, so this talks a little bit about what you can do. I have a QR code on this page, um, but it's also available on the AZLA website. We have an advocacy list. So you can click on that QR code or take a picture of your, whatever the, whatever people say, take a picture, go to the website on that QR code. You can sign up for AZLA's advocacy list. You'll get actions, alerts, and updates. I'm not going to promise regular updates all the time. I always have these high expectations. I'm going to be able to do that. And then life happens and I get some out, but I don't get them out all the time on a regular basis. Um, which brings me to my next point. If you are super passionate about this, and you want to help, reach out to me. Um, my email will be at the end because we can always use more members on the legislative committee um, because this is what we're doing legislatively right now is working with the lobbyists to help to block bills that are bad for libraries and support bills that will be good for libraries at a legislative level. Kind of taking a look at all of that and using our membership um, to work towards that. But we've heard requests from members to create an Arizona-specific toolkit to talk about how we can connect members across the state um, to support each other in some of these challenges, to um, create um, a list of books and titles that have been challenged in Arizona so we know what's happening around the state. I don't have the capacity to do all of those things. And the legislative committee as it stands doesn't have the capacity to do all of those things. So if you have any interest, I very much encourage you to join us um, because we would be able to with more people and uh, some more passion on there to uh, get some of that stuff off the ground. All right, I'm going to go through the next few things quickly, but revisit your reconsideration policy, keep a copy at your circulation desk, know it inside and out, um, and make sure that you know what's going on and all of your staff know what's going on. You and can make, go don't make the assumption that your reconsideration policy is current 
and these in your state don't make make the assumption that everybody has one because what we're finding out shockingly is that many people do not have one right. still so, so if you need help creating one reach out we can connect you to somebody that's done it recently um to look at that and uh, keep a copy at your surf desk create talking points for staff or an FAQ for faculty or administration. If you're in a school library, talk to your principal, talk to your faculty, have, make sure everyone knows what's going on in the library and what your process is. Practice, practice, practice. Um, so my colleagues that are school librarians, we did a presentation at ALA, Becky and uh, Amanda, and they talked about how they do this all the time with their colleagues where they talk through it and they have those conversations and they role play. All of that is fantastic. Make friends with library allies in your community and join United Against Book Bans. So there is a lot of stuff we can do um, as we move forward. Uh, and I feel like, you know, there's we're coming together. Things are coalescing. We have had some victories in court um, where there have been bills that have been struck down. Um, and we know that there are bills that have been passed in Arizona that would not stand up in court. But finding a group of people to take it to court can be a long process. Um, and expensive. So um, that's why we work to stop it before it gets passed. Ken, I'm going I'm, I'm to jump on a couple of the chat questions that I saw relating to this real quick. Anybody can join Unite Against Book Bans. It's not just a librarian uh, page. It is for anybody in the community, and we really hope that you'll drive uh, people in your community to join. Uh, it, it, and if you get on the page, you'll see all the organizations that have joined as well. And then somebody asked about reconsideration policies. Reconsideration policy is really just the policy that you set up administratively that you follow when somebody comes in to challenge a book. And it's very important that you follow that policy, uh, protects the person that's, that's challenging so that they have an expectation of what will happen when they ask for a book to be reconsidered. It's also a protection piece for the library because you have a set process that you walk through. And typically it involves a reconsideration phase uh, within uh, the library staff, up to the library director or administrator, and then potentially involving your library board. And I'm, I'm sure your state library or maybe your, your state chapter here has uh, different models on file. I was trying to be really quick with that, but... <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. And I, I was kind of trying to go through the um, chat real quick as you were talking. Um, so I we definitely can share. So please reach out to it's let I'll just go to the next slide if I can get it on the right page. So it's legislative at azla.org. Contact me that way. Um, and I can get back to you with an example of a reconsideration policy. And remember, you have the ability to write your reconsideration policy. So take a look at different things and use what makes sense for you and for your community. I would encourage you to think about, we you know, at MCLD have written into our policy that you can't come to us with a list of books and write a hundred books into the challenge. It has to be you know, something that you've read and that you can point to a specific section of the book that you find you know, that is offensive. Um, and then we can, we can address that one section. One of the comments I saw was from Pima County and um, I think it's correct that that often now what we're seeing are not people coming to libraries with a list of complaints about books, but they're going straight to your library board of trustees mm -hmm. or the board of supervisors, taking it straight to the top. Um, and I want to emphasize again the importance of educating as much as possible your board of supervisors, your library board of trustees. Talk to them, explain your process, explain what you're doing, have build those relationships because then when they do get complaints, you know, from the public it's going to trigger something in the back of their head and they're going to think, oh, I've had this conversation with that librarian. I understand what this might be. And now I can talk about how to handle that. But they'll already have an idea in place and they won't be reacting in that meeting to the questions that are coming to the meeting. Um, and they'll be willing to reach out to you with questions. And that's what we've seen success with um, across the state already. It's not the same everywhere, obviously. Arizona is a very diverse state. Um, there's some very rural areas of the state and some more urban. And so it really depends on where you are in the state. Um, but the more the people that might get complaints know about what libraries do, I think the better off you'll be because they're gonna have a better understanding about you, the work that you're doing and what the library is there for, what, the, what our purpose is. Yeah, you know, 
I think board education is really key there. You, you should educate them around intellectual freedom and book challenges and your reconsideration process, just like anything else. And kind of a practical way to look at it is if you have a board member who really has questions about appropriateness of books or that sort of thing, it's really better to have that in a, in maybe not necessarily a non-public setting, but a more private setting than when somebody has already challenged a book and you're trying to sort out the process with 50 or 100 people sitting in your auditorium. So. All right. So, Karina, are you able to facilitate other questions? What else has come through that we might be able to answer? Sure. Um, we had discussed pausing the uh, recording during the Q and A. We've already addressed some of them, but um, so Aaron and Kent, thank you so much for being with us, um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, you will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming, Kent. Take care. Right. Thank you. Thank you.